Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Lemire, and I am going to do or begin the second batch of <clears throat> reading Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by Marshall B. Rosenberg, PhD. Um, in case for some reason this is the first one you're seeing, uh, I also have already read the first three chapters. And this particular book, I have the second edition, uh, so it's an old, ratty used copy, but I think this is the third time I bought it, and so I'm just like running with it. Um, I don't think there's been too many changes to it, uh, just little edits here and there. Anyway, so I'm reading it in a book club through an organization where I teach called brightandark.org, and it's a shadow work resource center for magical practitioners. And we're really big into like our words and the intention behind them. And um, and so the book club has all decided to read the book together and learn and be able to practice within the platform. Uh, the Discord platform that we all have is a very supportive, amazing group of people who now we're all learning just different and better ways to be able to communicate. Anyway, and there's many of us in this group who are neurodivergent and um, and would benefit either from having the book read to them or having like reading along or that kind of thing with the parallel play. And we like to give as many possible accommodations that we can um, in that group. So without further ado, I'm going to now read to you chapter four in nonviolent communication. This uh, begins by saying, Identifying and expressing feelings. The first component of NVC is to observe without evaluating. The second component is to express how we are feeling. Uh, psychoanalyst Rolo Arroyo May <laughs> suggests, Rolo, it's probably Royo, Royo May, I don't know, suggests that the mature person becomes able to differentiate feelings into as many nuances, strong and passionate experiences, or delicate and sensitive ones, as in the different passages of music in a symphony. For many of us, however, our feelings are, as May would describe it, limited, like notes in a bugle call. The heavy cost of unexpressed feelings. Our repertoire of words for calling people names is often larger than our vocabulary of words that allow us to clearly describe our emotional states. Isn't that the truth, huh? I went through 21 years of American schools and I can't recall anyone in all that time ever asking me how I felt. Oh, feelings were simply not considered important. What was valued was the right way to think as defined by those who held positions of rank and authority. We are trained to be other other directed rather than to be in contact with ourselves we learn to be up in our head wondering what is it that others think is right for me to say or do an interaction i had with a teacher when i was about nine years old demonstrates how alienated from our feelings uh can be, can begin or wait alienation from our feelings can begin once i hid myself after school in a classroom because some boys were waiting outside to beat me up a teacher spotted me and asked me to leave the school. When I explained I was afraid to go, she declared, big boys don't get frightened. Marshall, can I just be here right now with you, with that version of you that heard that from your teacher? When I explained I was afraid to go, she declared, big boys don't get frightened. A few years later, I received further reinforcement through my participation in athletics. It was typical for coaches to value athletes willing to give it their all and to continue playing no matter how much physical pain they were in. I learned the lesson so well that I once continued playing baseball for a month with an untreated broken wrist. At an NVC workshop, a college student spoke up about a roommate who played the stereo so loudly it kept him awake. When asked to express what he felt when this happened, the student replied, I felt that it isn't right to play music so loud at night. I pointed out that when he followed the word feel with the word that, he was expressing an opinion, but not revealing his opinion, his feelings. At, and this is a lot of the stuff we do at Bright and Dark too, in, in the coaching and that kind of stuff is uh, bringing people in and recognizing where they're feeling so that we can start to express and uh, have those 
the emotions in us blossom and be supported with them. So that's cool. I'm glad this is being talked about in the book. Um, asked to try again to express his feelings. He responded, I feel when people do something like that, it's a person, a person personality disturbance. I explained that this was still an opinion rather than a feeling. He paused thoughtfully and then announced with vehemence, I have no feelings about this whatsoever. <laughs> This student obviously had strong feelings. Unfortunately, he didn't know how to become aware of his feelings, let alone express them. This difficulty in identifying and expressing feelings is common. And in my experience, especially so among lawyers, engineers, police officers, corporate managers, and career military personnel, people whose professional codes discourage them from manifesting emotions. For families, the toll is severe when members are unable to communicate emotions. Country and Western singer Reba McIntyre wrote a song after her father's death and titled it, The Greatest Man I Never Knew. In, doing, in so doing, she undoubtedly expressed the sentiments of many people who were never able to establish the emotional connection that they would have liked with their fathers. I regularly hear, hear statements like, I wouldn't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm married to a wonderful man, but I just, I never know what he's feeling. One such dissatisfied woman brought her spouse to a workshop, during which she told him, I feel like I'm married to a wall. The husband then did an excellent imitation of a wall. He sat mute and immobile. Exasperated, she turned to me and exclaimed, see, this is what happens all the time. He sits and says nothing. It's just like living with a wall. It sounds to me like you're feeling lonely and wanting more emotional contact with your husband, I responded. When she agreed, I tried to show how statements as I feel like I'm living with a wall, are unlikely to bring her feelings and desires to her husband's attention. In fact, they're more likely to be heard as criticism than an invitation to connect with, your fe with our feelings. Furthermore, such statements often lead to self-fulfilling prophecies. A husband, for example, hears himself criticized for behaving like a wall. He is hurt and discouraged and doesn't respond, thereby, thereby confirming his wife's image of him as a wall. The benefits of strengthening our feelings vocabulary are evident not only in intimate relationships, but also in the professional world. I was once hired to consult with the members of a technological department of a large Swiss corporation troubled by the discovery that workers in their departments were avoiding them. When asked why, employees from other departments responded, we hate going there to consult with those people. It's like talking to a bunch of machines the problem abated when I spent time with the members of the technological department, encouraging them to express more of their humanness in their communications with coworkers. In another instance, I was working with the administrators of a hospital who were anxious about forthcoming meeting with the hospital's physicians. They wanted support for a project that the physicians had only recently turned down by a vote of 17 to 1. The administrators were eager to have me demonstrate how they might use NVC when approaching the physicians. Assuming the voice of an administrator in a role playing session, I opened with, I'm feeling frightened to be bringing this up this or wait, I'm feeling frightened to be bringing up this issue. I chose to start this way because I sensed how frightened the administrators were as they prepared to confront those physicians on this topic again. Before I could continue, one of the administrators stopped me to protest. You're being unrealistic. We could never tell the physicians that we were frightened. When I asked why an admission of fear seemed so impossible, he replied without hesitation. If we admitted we're frightened, then they would just pick us to pieces. His answer didn't surprise me. I've often heard people say that they cannot imagine ever expressing feelings at their workplace. I was pleased to learn, however, that one of the administrators did decide to risk expressing his vulnerability at the dreaded meeting. Instead of his customary manner of appearing strictly logical, rational, and unemotional, he chose to state his feelings together with reasons for wanting the physicians to change their position. He noted how differently the physicians responded to him. In the end, he was amazed and relieved when instead of being picked to pieces by the physicians, they reversed their previous position, voting 17 to one to support the project instead. This dramatic turnaround helped the administrators realize and appreciate the potential impact of expressing 
one's vulnerability, even at the workplace. And then it has a little note here saying, expressing our vulnerability can help resolve conflicts. Damn straight. <laughs> Finally, let me share a personal incident that taught me the effects of hiding our feelings. I was teaching a course in NVC to a group of inner city students. When I walked into the room the first day, the students who had been enjoying a lively conversation with each other became quiet. Good morning, I greeted, silence. I felt very uncomfortable, but was afraid to express it. Instead, I proceeded in my most professional manner. For this class, we'll be studying a process of communication that I hope that you'll find helpful in your relationships at home and with your friends. I continued to present information about NBC, but no one seemed to be listening. One girl rummaging through her bag, fished out a file and began vigorously filing her nails. Students near the windows glued their faces to the pane as if fascinated by what was going on on the street below. I felt increasingly more uncomfortable, yet continued to say nothing. Finally, a student who had certainly more courage than I was demonstrating piped up. You just hate being with black people, don't you? I was stunned, yet immediately realized how I had contributed to this student's perception by trying to hide my discomfort. I am feeling nervous, I admitted, but not because you are black. My feelings have to do with me not my not knowing anyone here and wanting to be accepted when I came in the room. This expression of my vulnerability had a pronounced effect on the students. They started to ask questions about me, to tell me things about themselves, and to express curiously uh, or curiosity about NBC. Feelings versus non-feelings. A common confusion generated by, oh, by the way, I just wanted to make a note on that one. Holy crap. Now this is something I've actually done in my life, at like one mask and push down all my feelings for the first half of it. But then the second half of my life so far, I have absolutely led with as much vulnerability as possible and with my feelings on the forefront. And I am often told by people that I feel safe to them. They tend to want to talk to me. Um, they, everyone always kind of knows where I am with things uh, because it's, and so because of that, I guess I feel safe because you don't have to wonder what's under the mask because I'm willing to express myself emotionally. Um, and I can attest to how many times that leading with the emotion has broken the ice in conversations. Uh, you know, like almost every time I'm in an elevator, if it's like one to three, four floors, then I don't like sometimes say something. But if I'm in an elevator and it's like, oh, we're going to be here for like 10 floors <laughs> or something. And there's just two of us or like whatever. Then there's that like really awkward. Oh God, now I'm going to have to do small talk or like, do you say anything? Or you just sit there and act like there's not other human beings in a box with you. Right. And it's like, Ah, it's like, I can't really do that um, because I, I just, there are people there. It's like, I'm an elephant in the room pointer. Anyway, so I noticed that a lot of times I will say something like, just out loud, like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, I'm, I always get nervous in elevators because I never know if I'm supposed to say anything or do anything or acknowledge. And I even say to them, and I really hate small talk. I like deep conversation. So then I just say, I think you are fine. I'll bet you're a fine person. We have limited time to find out anything deep today. So I just bid you having a good day. <laughs> Anyway, and that has started some of the best conversations I've ever had then have turned out to be in just fleeting times in an elevator. Um, also at parties or just any other big social things, um, leading with how I feel like, yeah, I'm nervous. I don't know anybody here and I'm, I feel awkward. I don't know what, what, if I'm supposed to eat, if I should, if it's rude not to eat. And I can't tell you how many times that the person I end up telling that to is like, you know, me too. It feels so good to be able to talk about this. And then, you know, then our ice is broken and we can have a natural, more realistic, like real conversation. And then it, like when that starts and then the authenticity starts happening at one side of the room, that's palpable. And then I noticed that people tend to flock to that. And then they, and, and, and so like me and like, you know, some six or seven other people at parties end up having the deepest conversations and tend to like be Facebook friends afterward and like 
you know, connect. Uh, whereas the small talk situation is like, I don't even barely remember people's names for that. And um, it just doesn't get as deep, you know? So anyway, I just wanted to share my personal thing on that because I, I just, I, I've never had it work out badly when I've led with my truth of my emotions, especially if I, I keep a period on the end of the emotion where I'm just like, yeah, I'm feeling really nervous period. So I'm taking responsibility for it. And it's not like, I'm just nervous because right there, I might say that too. I'm nervous because I don't know anyone or whatever. Um, so it's not like I've done this perfectly, but, uh, but at least leading with that and and having an energetic idea that I am taking responsibility for that. Everyone has felt nervous in their lives. And so it's something we can all relate to. And um, the circumstances, however, we all have different perspectives on, but we've all felt all of the different emotions. Even if we can't express them, we understand or have like been in positions where they, they could arise. Um, anyway, so yes, leading with feelings, huge, huge, huge. Feelings versus non-feelings. A common confusion generated by the English language is our use of the word feel without actually expressing a feeling. Oh, right? For example, in the sentence, I feel I didn't get a fair deal. The words I feel could be more accu accurately replaced with I think. In general, feelings are not being clearly expressed when the word feel, feel is followed by, I feel that you should know better. I feel like a failure. I feel as if I'm living with a wall. The pronoun, pronouns I, you, he, she, they, it. I feel I am constantly on call. I feel it is useless. Or C, names or nouns referring to people. I feel Amy has been pretty responsible. I feel my boss is being manipulative. And then the little side note here says, distinguish feelings from thoughts and distinguish between what we feel and what we think we are. Conversely, in the English language, it is not necessary at all to use the word feel when we're actually uh, when we're actually expressing a feeling. Oh, this is a big one. Let's highlight that. I'm going to say it again. It is not necessary at all to use the word feel when we're actually expressing a feeling. We can say I'm feeling irritated or simply I'm irritated. Ooh, that's a good one. And I, uh, I am a, I use the word feel all the time. And I insert it in so many different places where uh, I'm so identified with my feelings that I, like, I, I just, whether I'm feeling them, whether I'm talking about them, whether it's in sentence. So this is one that I am definitely um, up for the challenge of getting better at and uh, it it hit me to just to just realize, oh my gosh, if I'm ever having to say that I feel something, there is a way to shorten that even and not even having to say the I feel or like the word feel. I'm irritated. And that's even owning it more. I'm sad. I'm angry. Oh, so good. So good. In NBC, we distinguish between words that express actual feelings and those that describe what we think we are. Description a, a description of what we think we are would be, I feel inadequate as a guitar player. This is a truth for me too. <laughs> that is just not easy. Anyway, in this statement, I am assessing my ability as a guitar player rather than clearly expressing my feelings. B, expressions of actual feelings would be, I feel disappointed in myself as a, as, as a guitar player, or I feel impatient with myself as a guitar player, or I feel frustrated with myself as a guitar player. The actual feeling behind my assessment of myself as inadequate could therefore be disappointment, impatience, frustration, or uh, some other emotion. Likewise, it's helpful to differentiate between words that describe what we think others are doing around us and words that describe actual feelings. The following are examples of statements that are easily mistaken as expressions of feelings. In fact, they reveal more how we think others are behaving than what we're actually feeling ourselves. So distinguish between what we feel and how we think others react or behave toward us. So A, I feel unimportant to the people with whom I work. 
The word unimportant describes how I think others are evaluating me rather than an actual feeling. So in the last few chapters, we were doing a lot of evaluation, um, like as far as how we're evaluating a little bit more outwardly. This right here is sort of this invitation to see when people are delivering stuff to, to, to us, how much they might be actually evaluating us to the detriment of them owning their feelings, which also if we're matching it, we're likely probably having that sort of feeling too. So we can use that as a clue to look internally and be like, hmm, I'm sensing that they're feeling angry about this. Uh, and then just be like, hmm, what kind of anger might I be having right now? It could also feel like total projection and stuff too, but there's always uh, some energetic reason for it. It may be that even though that day uh, they're projecting or something that we like have been a part or in a part that was very similar to how they were acting in the past and we didn't like it about ourselves, you know, that kind of stuff. And so that might be um, a way to look into uh, some further healing in that particular dynamic. But oh my goodness, this whole like taking out evaluations and judgments from sentences and how we speak and how we think about things is so huge. Okay, so here's another one. I feel misunderstood. Here the word misunderstood indicates my assessment of the other person's level of understanding rather than an actual feeling. In this situation, I may be feeling anxious or annoyed or some other emotion. And C, I feel ignored. Again, this is more of an interpretation of the actions of others rather than a clear statement of how we are feeling. No doubt there have been times we thought we were being ignored and our feeling was relief because we wanted to be left by, to ourselves. No doubt we were other times, however, when we felt hurt, when we thought we were being ignored because we had wanted to be, uh, we wanted to be involved. Words like ignored express how we interpret others rather than how we feel. Here's a sampling of such words. Oh my God, this is such a big deal. So when I skimmed through this book the last few times, I've always gotten, every time I've gotten the book, I've gotten some nuggets out of it, but this is the first time I'm like going page by page and like really giving it attention. And um, the last time I skimmed through here and, and saw this part about these are interpreting words that aren't feelings. Holy crap. So I want you to think about just how many times you or in myself, we've said out loud the words, I feel before these words. Ready? Have you ever said, I feel abandoned. I feel abused. I feel attacked. I feel betrayed. I feel boxed in. I feel bullied. I feel cheated. I feel coerced, co-opted, cornered, diminished distrusted, interrupted, intimidated, let down, manipulated. How many times I've said, I feel manipulated. <laughs> I feel neglected. I feel overworked, patronized, pressured, provoked, put down, rejected. I feel rejected. I feel taken for granted. I feel threatened, unappreciated, unheard, unseen, unsupported, unwanted, and used. How about that one, right? I feel used. Holy crap. Oh my God. So now like think of uh, like how much this opens up to how we go forward in our thinking about emotions. One, now we have the little shortcut in us that says anytime that we say the word feel out loud, that it's actually not necessary, which doesn't mean like to scold yourself if you say the word feel, but just become or add infuse more awareness in that if you're saying, I feel something, usually it's like, I feel sad. You can just say, I'm sad. And that gets even closer to home and like points at exactly what it is. Anyway, so this just opens also more shortcuts because now that we've had some of these words leap out at us, um, it'll just kind of be an extra like, hey, we know we've heard that word before. What's that NVC context this is in again? And it'll bring us back there so that we can kind of be like, oh, okay. So if I'm feeling abandoned ever, or I'm feeling rejected, 
or manipulated or misunderstood. Oh my God, that's such a big one. What that's actually saying is that I am assuming and evaluate how someone else is evaluating me or the situation and to the detriment of feeling. So if, and when I am feeling misunderstood, what would be more accurate for me when I'm feeling misunderstood, I am actually feeling frustrated, angry, anxious, sad, lonely, hopeless, powerless, and worthless. <clears throat> and I'm open to others. It's just, that's what I was feeling into right now. Anyway, oh my gosh, isn't this great? Okay, so building a vocabulary for feelings. In expressing our feelings, it helps us to use words that refer to specific emotions rather than words that are vague or general. For example, if we say, I feel good about that. The word good could mean happy, excited, relieved, or a number of other emotions. Words such as good and bad prevent the listener from connecting easily with what we might actually be feeling. The following lists have been compiled to help you increase your power to articulate feelings and clearly describe a whole range of emotional states. Ta-da! Okay, so for the sake of... Um, just time on this. I am not going to read every single one of these. You can, if you don't have the book right now, take a screenshot or look it up. I'm sure it's somewhere. Okay. So basically those are some ways to get started. And I think I have the mirror thing where you see it, right? Anyway. Um, <clears throat> And this is an assignment I think that we're going to have that we'll put out to book club members and people that are into this is um, to go through and to get more used to our emotional vocabulary and to try on some of these words. Uh, and what I would recommend is maybe going word for word and then putting your hand on your heart and just being like, what does like the first one absorbed? What does it feel like to feel absorbed? and ask your body, show me what this might mean to feel absorbed. It also is a good link too, because in doing this exercise, it'll kind of root around for situations where you have felt like that and maybe didn't have the vocabulary. So this is a great in to shadow work because you're like, huh, when have I felt absorbed? And like, ding, oh, there's that guy that one time that I just felt really absorbed by his energy. And it's like, oh, okay, is there any trauma going on there? Is there any unforgiveness? You know, it's a way to kind of heal that. And then like the next one, okay, body, I am feeling adventurous. What does that feel like as a physical sensation inside of my body? And then you may take a moment again from a place of neutrality where we're not triggered to just be kind of like, okay, what is adventurous linked to in the past? For some, it may actually be like joy and freedom Others adventure might terrify them and their body might do something differently, right? So this is such a great idea to, to see how our wiring has been kind of set up with some of these emotional words. It gives us a chance to be like, oh, that's interesting. When I feel adventurous, I actually clench up. Well, that's interesting. Not everyone that feels adventurous does that. That means if I'm clenching up, I have trauma around adventurous or feeling adventurous what does adventure mean to me? See, so you can go down a whole rabbit hole with each one of these words and it will kind of dredge up anything of the past of like where you might have formed limiting beliefs about being adventurous. It may like where there's fears, phobias, um, again, trauma situations, or uh, again, you might find like situations where there's unforgiveness with either another person or yourself, that kind of stuff. So anyway, I highly recommend going through and doing that exercise when it comes to these words. And then the summary on the next page says, the second component necessary for expressing ourselves is feelings. By developing a vocabulary of feelings that allows us to clearly and specifically name or identify our emotions, we can connect more easily with one another. Allowing ourselves to be vulnerable by expressing our feelings can help resolve conflicts. NVC distinguishes the expression of actual feelings from words and statements that describe thoughts, assessments, and interpretations. So that was in, summer, in summary. 
um, of that. Uh, okay, I'm gonna stall another page here. And then this one is, if you would like to see, this is called exercise two, expressing feelings. If you would like to see whether we're in agreement about the verbal expression of feelings, circle the number in front of any of the following statements in which feelings are verbally expressed. Number one, I feel you don't love me. Well, let's look at that. Or I guess we'll just say what he says here. Um, if you circled this number, we're not in agreement. I don't consider you don't love me to be a feeling. To me, it expresses what the speaker thinks the other person is feeling rather than how the speaker is feeling. Whenever the words I feel are followed by the words I, you, he, she, they, it, that, like, or as if, what follows is generally not what I would consider to be a feeling. Examples of an of expression of feeling might be, I'm sad or I'm feeling anguished. I just laugh because how many times have you heard someone say, I am feeling anguished? Because <laughs> we don't have a good vocabulary of it. Let's become the kind of people that say stuff like that. I'm feeling anguished. Let's bring back anguished. <laughs> the second one, I'm sad that you're leaving. Okay, so I'm going to say on this one, I'm sad that um, could just be I'm sad. Um, it is kind of, well, let's see, it is saying a statement about it. They still can be sad. And that's the reason that triggered it. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Because by saying, I'm sad that you're leaving, it's saying I'm sad. So there's recognition there, but it's also putting it on that you're leaving, which then takes that responsibility away from us being in our experience. Um, I wonder, well, I'm going to see, because I, I haven't looked to see what the answer is on that one yet. I wonder if it would, like the best way of saying that would be like, because how would you communicate that otherwise? I guess you could just say, even when someone's leaving, it's like, yeah, I'm feeling sad. Well, let's just see what he says here. Oh, okay. If you're circle this number, we're in agreement that a feeling was verbally expressed. Okay. Okay. That's probably why it was so tricky for me because I was like, wait a minute. I'm sad that you're leaving. I guess there's something about it that anytime you're including somebody else like that, like I'm just looking at it as the energetic thing because saying like, I'm sad that you're leaving. And if we're taking complete uh, pers uh, pers responsibility for our emotional experience, that one feels a little on the fence in that it's still kind of roping somebody in there. But then the other thing is like, if the person's leaving, yeah, how else are you going to say that? So I'm glad that that one actually was good because I was just like, how would I retool that one? Like I can be, I'm sad because somebody's leaving. I think what it is, is that so much shadow work is, is what will happen in this case. This is where I get a stickiness. So even though I think it's definitely was said correctly and that there's no other way of taking that out, I think what will happen is that then every time we look outside of ourselves at the person who has left, the sadness gets connected with the storyline so much that we don't ever actually practice the sadness. In fact, we can build up resentment because every time that we think about them, it's like we're mad that they left us, right? So I think that there definitely could be um, still a, a longer term victim label on stuff like this. But I do still think, yeah, this would be the best way that you can communicate it if somebody's asking you, you know, what's going on? I'm sad because you're leaving. Um, the next one is, when you don't greet me, I feel neglected. Okay, that's clearly um, one that we went on before. That's just like a judge or an evaluation of how they're looking at us. Five, I'm happy that you can come. Um, that one feels, yeah, in agreement, okay. You're disgusting. Obviously, that's an evaluation. Seven, I feel like hitting you. Hmm, that's an interesting one. I mean, it's definitely not a feeling because a feeling like that's an action. 
How do they say that one? If you circle this number, we're not in agreement. I don't consider like hitting you to be a feeling. To me, it expresses what the speaker imagines doing. Oh, okay, here we go. An expression of feeling instead there might be, I'm furious at you. Okay. It's still the at you part still to me feels like it's gonna engage some kind of reactivity. But nonetheless, um, I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling furious. Okay. I feel misunderstood. So we've talked about that one before too. That one is, um, uh, I don't consider misunderstood to be a feeling. It expresses what the speaker thinks the other person is doing. An expression of feeling in this case might be, I feel frustrated or I feel discouraged. Nine, I feel good about you, what you did for me. Yeah, so that one is says um, that that was verbally expressed. However, the word good is vague when used to convey a feeling. We can usually express our feelings more clearly by using other words. In this instance, relieved, gratified, and encouraged could work. And then 10, I'm worthless. Um, now that one, okay, here. If you circled this, we're not in agreement. I don't consider worthless to be a feeling. Um, I've seen worthless on feelings worksheets before, but you know, there is a, an evaluation in it. So I'm willing to update that, but I've definitely, um, seen that on, on things and stuff. So that's interesting, but anyway, here it's, oh, okay. So there's a better word for worthless. And that's to me, it expresses how the speaker thinks about him or herself rather than how the speaker's feeling examples of an expression of feeling might be, I feel skeptical about my own talents or I feel wretched, wretched. We're bringing back wretched and anguished. Okay, so that was chapter four. I'll be back later for more chapters, but I'm going to put this one on the bag. See you next time. Bye.